Stuart Buck spent nine years as the VP of research at Arnold Ventures, where he led internationally renowned work on scientific reproducibility, including strategizing the launch of the Center for Open Science and other projects. Uh, he was one of six people in the US and Europe invited to advise the GAO on its 2021 effort to improve federally funded research. He has lectured at DARPA and IARPA and has authored pieces in science and nature on how to improve research. And Stuart is going to give a talk now uh, on the reproducibility crisis is most published research wrong. So Stuart, uh, I'd invite you to share your slides, please. Um, so here's the introductory slide, um, no conflicts of interest, um, no copyright that I care about, like, feel free to reuse anything you see. Um, so the title of my presentation is Most Published Research Wrong. Um, now that's a little bit of a provocative title and we'll get into that in a second. Um, so first, a little bit about me. So my background, um, as she mentioned, I was uh, for nine years, the vice president of research at a $2 billion philanthropy called Arnold Ventures, formerly the Arnold Foundation. Um, while there, I supported somewhere over $60 million, as I can best estimate, of work on improving evidence, such as uh, open science, reproducibility, et cetera, um, help launch the Center for Open Science. Um, I'll talk about a number of other projects uh, a little bit later. Um, help launch a, a center called Vivli, B-I-V-L-I, that shares clinical trial data from medicine. Um, so uh, did a bunch of stuff there, had the privilege to do that. Um, but the title of my presentation harkens back to an article uh, by John Iwanidis, uh, a Greek scholar who is uh, currently at Stanford, uh, called Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. Now, of course, um, John Iwanidis did not go back and actually re-examine all possible research findings, like no one could do that. Um, but the, the impetus of his article, which has been cited something like a million times, um, is that if you make a certain uh, number of modest assumptions, fairly modest assumptions, such as you know, the, the probability of finding a you know, positive effect and the average sample size and the degree to which there is a little bit of um, you know, flexibility on researchers' part, um, then you end up, and, and, oh, and also some publication bias on the journal's part, right? Then you end up with the inevitable conclusion that once everything gets through that filter, uh, most of the positive findings that end up published in the literature are probably false positives. Um, so it was a very striking kind of uh, uh, estimation and article that he published. Um, and again, cited many, many uh, times uh, for that. And uh, so, so that's kind of the uh, impetus for uh, this presentation. So let's dig into a few details. So one of the projects that I sponsored at Arnold uh, was called uh, Estimating the Reproducibility of Psychological Science, or at least that's the title that was published in Science in 2015. Um, it was a project that uh, tried to reproduce 100 psychology experiments um, published in top psychology journals. And as you can see there from the abstract, uh, what they found after all this labor was that about one third to one half, somewhere around 40% of, uh, of the effects in the original psychology studies um, could be successfully replicated. Uh, the rest were a little bit uh, you know, mixed or, or just emphatically not replicated. Um, so that, that publication uh, was fairly influential, I have to say, but it's psychology. So you might think psychology, you know, who cares about psychology? Um, you know, it's not that hard of a science and probably some psychologists aren't very smart to begin with. So let's uh, look at another project. Um, the reproducibility project in cancer biology. And this was just by happenstance uh, released in the past week. Now, this was another project that, full disclosure, I funded uh, from the Arnold Foundation um, almost seven, eight years ago. Um, the, the goal was to reproduce um, 
about 50 papers from cancer biology. And the, well, I mean, the long story short, the, the project took much longer and was much more expensive than anyone, including myself, would have thought at the time. And the whole reason for that was precisely the fact that it's really hard to replicate stuff. Like in every single case, they looked at published articles and they could not figure out what to rep what what to actually do. Um, and moreover, yeah, again, you might have seen the headlines this week. Um, they found that when they replicated all these experiments in cancer biology, um, well, I don't, I guess I can't highlight it right here, but uh, the quote the median effect size in the replications was eighty five percent smaller than the median effect size in the original experiments. So that, again, kind of like the psychology project, tells us that uh, publications tend to have this bias towards positive and exa possibly exaggerated effects that are not just hard to replicate, but that if they're replicated at all, tend to be smaller. Um, so there was a second publication along with this that goes more into the details of what I was talking about, about how difficult it was. Um, so this is a, the abstract from that publication. Um, they found that uh, in every single case, they had to contact the original authors to try to find out what actually happened in this experiment. Like there just wasn't enough information from the publication. Um, they say that despite contacting the authors of the original papers, we were unable to obtain these data for 68% of the experiments. Um, they also report that uh, the authors were very helpful in 40%, 40, 41% of the experiments, but minimally helpful or not at all helpful for the rest. So, you know, I mean, the example was like they would contact a lab and the lab would say, either nothing at all, or I would say, sorry, we had a grad student who did that experiment. They're long gone. Like, we don't know what happened. And then they'd be kind of at a loss in trying to do this replication like project. Like, what do we even do? Like, you know, we've got like half the details to do the experiment and the original lab says they can't help us with the rest. So, um, you know, they, they ran into a lot of obstacles like doing this project. Okay, so that's cancer biology. So let's get, move a little closer to home uh, for this conference. Um, so here's a publication that just came out last year. Assessment of the frequency and nature of erroneous X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy analysis in the, in the scientific literature. Um, this analysis of over 400 publications of X-ray you know, literature uh, found that there were many errors. Um, it showed that more than 65% kind of had overfitting, so to speak. Um, there were major errors in 30, 40% of, of the cases. So, uh, you know, kind of, kind of disturbing. Okay, let, let's talk about MRI or fMRI in this case, um, literature. So here is one of the most famous, uh, I guess, posters in the fMRI literature. This was from 2009. Um, some uh, scholars who work in fMRI and uh, brain analysis, so to speak, um, decided that there was a lot, way too much flexibility. So they said, let's, let's put a literal dead fish into an MRI machine and have the machine scan it and let's see what happens, right? So you can see there on the poster, they report that one Atlantic salmon participated in the study uh, it was 18 inches long, weighed 3.8 pounds, and was not alive at the time of scanning, right? So then they presented the salmon, this dead salmon, with a series of photographs depicting human individuals in social situations with a you know, particular emotional valence, meaning like it might be sad, might be angry. Um, and then, quote, the salmon was asked to determine what emotion the individual in the photo must have been experiencing. Well, long story short, they found that once you did all these analyses and um, if you failed to correct for multiple comparisons in the statistical sense, 
you actually were able to find that there were occasions where it seemed like the salmon's brain was lighting up um, and, and, and in terms of, you know, representing particular human emotions. Um, obviously false, obviously a false finding. Um, so this, this kind of hit the fMRI world, um, I think, by storm. Um, so there were a number of publications after that, you know, how reliable are the results from functional, functional magnetic resonance imaging, um, cluster failure, why fMRI inferences you know, have inflated false positive rates, et cetera. Um, so uh, there have been a num number of other publications since. Um, just last year, again, there is another uh, uh, kind of meta-analysis of, of uh, fMRI studies on uh, kind of what they call common task measures and found that, uh, you know, it's, it's not very reliable to like kind of determine what the brain biomarkers are uh, for this type of research. Um, a, you know, article about this research or this study showed that, um, uh, you know, the, the bottom line is that this, this sort of common task based fMRI in its current form can't tell you what an individual's brain activation will look like from one test to the next. Um, so this researcher was uh, very frustrated because he'd done a lot of this research. And he said, this is more relevant to my work than just about anyone else's. This is my fault. I'm going to throw myself under the bus. This whole sub branch of fMRI could go instinct if we can't address this critical limitation. So kind of serious there. Um, another study also just published last year. Um, in this case, uh, they took some fMRI data from over 100 people. Um, each of whom were asked to perform a task about decision making um, involving some sort of risk. And then they gave this data to 70 teams of researchers, literally 70 teams. Like, this is a huge project, right? It's, it's like kind of exhaust, uh, it's exhausting just to imagine how much work it was to keep track of what they did here, right? 70 teams gave them the data and said, okay, analyze these hypotheses about how individuals in these MRI machines are analyzing risk and how the brains are activating and so forth, right? So uh, the finding was that across the nine hypotheses, 20% of teams reported a result that differs from the majority. Um, and this demonstrates that analytic choices have a major effect on reported results. Um, so uh, another description of the findings. The team's results vary dramatically for five of the nine hypotheses being investigated. Um, sometimes there were teams that reported a positive result and other teams that reported a negative result for the same question on the same data, right? So Russ Podrak, um, a Stanford professor, uh, said that the main concerning takeaway from our study is that given exactly the same data and the same hypotheses, different teams of researchers came to very different conclusions. Um, so kind of disturbing if you think about it, right? Um, so advice would be adapt good practices, share data if possible, share code um, if possible, share the results no matter what, whether they're positive, negative, mixed, you know, messy, et cetera. Pre-register the research so that you kind of tie yourself down in advance. Um, do robustness checks. Um, you use the best statistical methods you can. Um, if you want to share data, again, full disclosure, this is a, 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 grant, a former grantee of mine that I helped launch the Stanford Center for Reproducible Neuroscience uh, with Russ Poldrack. So they host the um, Open Neuro Project, um, which I'll go to the next slide. Uh, Open Neuro is a free platform for sharing uh, data on MRI and other forms of data. Um, and this, this is about brain data, by the way. So there might be folks who use MRI for other types of other types of research, other types of data. This is about brain uh, data in particular. Um, but it's a place to go and share data uh, in a way that's consistent and um, that's well known. Um, so I mean, the goal is that with, with broader sharing of data, with broader use of these kinds of best practices, um, that hopefully the research can be um, elevated to even a more robust and uh, rigorous uh, status uh, than has been the case in the past. Um, so anyway, that's my presentation. Uh, thanks so much. Glad, glad we finally got online here. Yes. 
<laughs> so thank you very much, Stuart. That was great. Um, I appreciated the work that you highlight. Hopefully I can figure out how to stop sharing screen. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, so any attendees are welcome to put questions in the Q&A or the chat. Um, Stuart, I was wondering, so you mentioned a few uh, practices that could be adopted. Um, you know, when if you think about like manufacturing, there is, you know, GMP, good manufacturing practices, and those are documented and written down. Are there any um, documented resources that you know of? That's a good question. Um, so there are some guidelines uh, for journals and funders um, called the TOP guidelines, TOP, T, which stands for Transparency and Openness of Promotion. Um, those are some really kind of generic guidelines about sharing data, sharing code, et cetera. Um, when it comes to MRI specific research, I'm not as familiar with that specifically about whether there's really a code of best practices that is really aimed at improving reproducibility. Um, there, there may well be for all I know, actually. So, um, but, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's a number of best practices uh, out there, you know, that are more broad and generic to, you know, across a number of fields. Okay. Thank you.